The views and opinions of this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers. There is substantial risk of loss in trading futures and options, which you should carefully consider prior to trading. We had a solid upside day in soybean oil. That helped soybeans get a little bit of positive uh, number on the day Thursday. Corn slightly lower at the close. Wheat a little pressure in Chicago KC. Lower day in livestock. Kind of had a a risk-off tone in some of these markets and largely kind of took a pause on the broader grain market rally we've been having the last few sessions on the day Thursday. Let's talk about it. Joining us now for a conversation, Brian Doherty, Senior Market Advisor at Total Farm Marketing. Brian, good to catch up with you again here this week. And uh, yeah, it kind of we got a little positivity at the close in soybeans. Largely, though, it just felt like we... Maybe we're taking a little profit in grains on Thursday. It was a little bit of a quieter day than what we've been having here since uh, we talked last week. Yeah. You know, it, last week it kind of got started. We talked about that when we were talking last week. And then we went into this weekend, three day weekend, and you know, with a pretty good recovery off the lows earlier in the week, uh, corn in particular, contract lows early in the week, come back from the uh, uh, Labor Day holiday and some really good strength on Tuesday. And even today, Jesse, look at the, the soybeans finishing a couple cents higher. They've had a good push lately, but we had some export sales again. We had announcements today, 189,700 tons to unknown destinations, and then 126,000 tons to soybeans. Push those two numbers together, and you got about to, uh, what about three, three fifty? You're talking somewhere in the range about fifteen, eighteen million bushels. It's a lot of bushels. So good sales today. Very um, good sales. Yeah, very good. Yeah, sales, Brian. yeah. Good announced sales and some short covering that continues in the bean complex. And last week we talked, and I, I, I indicated. I think one of the things we're hearing from our customers, uh, in particular the southern half of the Midwest, is that August kind of wasn't uh, the best month. It was uh, generally hotter uh, than July and uh, uh, just a, a lack of good solid rains. Um, as an example, talk to another farmer, now this in the southern Midwest, but he's in the northwest corner of uh, Ohio. So the last rain he had was August 6th. So he's gone 30 days now or 29 days without a rain. So some of that's going to be impactful. And I want to maybe make the argument that the USDA could be a little bit robust on the yield, not because of anything they've done. It's just that the way the weather has sort of been uh, panning out here. And then you look at the six to 10 day forecast and it doesn't look like a whole lot of relief on the front of drier weather. And you've got now above normal temperatures forecasted. So, so fall is going to come pretty quick or harvest is going to come pretty quick for a lot of producers. I know this week, uh, in terms of that soy complex, bean oil in particular, uh, we've had that news, this uh, trade spat between China and Canada with uh, canola and more and some retaliation for Canada with their uh, tariffs on Chinese EV batteries. That That's kind of been in this market. You mentioned the sales to China and unknown and looked like that maybe helped out the uh, basis in the PNW uh, Wednesday evening into Thursday as well. And you talk about the weather too. It just feels like there's been uh, canola was supportive on Thursday and palm oil, et cetera. It just feels like there was enough fresh news in that oil seed market to really be the, the big driver here on Thursday. You know, Jess, I, I, I think that was, uh, that was well-spoken. That was well, well put the, um, and if I take one step back, I just want to take a step back and, and we look at corn and we look at wheat and we talk about some drier conditions in the black sea region. Again, wheat pounded up pretty hard, good recovery here as a lately. What was really interesting, though, is we're seeing some of the markets, maybe maybe all, maybe corn, beans, and wheat, all, I guess I should say, in some way or another, crossed over some pretty critical moving averages that have just been like wet rags over the market since basically since late May or sometime in early June. And so to see that kind of move there. So what it tells me is that the, um, and there were some rumors, and, and be careful with rumors, but there was some talk or rumors that the funds were basically beginning to buy back shorts and roll crops. Um, maybe the belief there's potentially limited downside potential for the risk that could be at hand. Uh, 
and maybe exiting equities. And so, you know, calling it good on the equities with good gains in the books and now buying back grains or maybe starting to go long grains. One thing I wanted to point out, though, and I saw this last week and I'm not sure if we touched on it when we last talked, but, you know, I was looking at December of 25 corn. So next year, corn, holding a premium for sure to this December and even this September contract, this December contract, probably a 35 cent premium. Forget that for now. Just look at the pure price. We're at 430 a bushel. Boy, you take a basis off of that. Uh, it's not cut for anybody. And to think for the next year, we're going to sit at that level. It doesn't work for any corn farmer that I know, but it works for every end user I know. And so to my point, the end user, whether corn's four dollars, four twenty, three eighty, three fifty, maybe even four fifty, it's still cheap corn. It's you're buying it for cost or less. So we started to see that contract come to life a little bit too. And it, it'll take you back to the last USDA report. Kind of surprised us didn't raise the, the carryout, right? About the same. Mm -hmm. So you're 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 looking at maybe a situation that you've got your highest yield projection on the table. You've got demand that is likely building at these lower prices, and it's been tepid all year. Kind of look at all these, you know, dry weather maps and drought maps and all of that. There's just not much weather premium from the world's perspective on any of these long-term contracts. So I think the funds are starting to recognize that. And, uh, you know, one or two, if maybe they're saying, okay, we've, uh, we've hedged our bets, so to speak, long enough here, and to your point, maybe uh, wanting to move some money either back to grains or, or to the sidelines even here and just say, okay, we're going to take a little bit of a pause and maybe let these markets breathe a little bit, so to speak, Brian. Couldn't agree more. There's there's one other element that I really didn't touch on, but if you look at like corn, beans, and wheat, and and if you look at what's called like seasonal charts or seasonal strength, we've got to be careful to use terms that, that it's hard to peg a meaning to. But time of year, let's just use common sense. Time of year, you've got everything kind of factored into the negative. So to feed the bear, you, 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 you might need some more news when things get suppressed. So it looks like the markets are trying to turn. looks like they're trying to put a bottom in. I want to hedge myself or my disclaimer is I, you know, it's only one person's opinion. Um, but I think pullbacks are now going to be looked on or viewed upon as areas where farmers don't sell new crop and not that they're selling any here, uh, but don't sell into the weakness. They've got time to wait and for end users to step it up. And I think long-term, I think I want to think that the the kind of the investment community is just perceptive of, you know, potential world events weather-wise and how the quickly that could change things when prices seem like there's so much supply and they're low. It's good value to somebody and prices are dynamic. They don't stand still. To your point, when you, you brought up December 25 corn, I, I think about even though harvest, the onslaught of harvest is going to be in front of us here in the next several weeks, a lot of decisions uh, that are going to have to be made for seed, chem, you name it, for 2025. And, you know, to your point, how this doesn't necessarily, this price doesn't work for a lot of folks. I think December corn at the close Thursday, 447 and a quarter. You look at soybeans, November 25, 1067 at a quarter. I mean, either way, it's a tough conversation for a lot of <laughs> folks to have as they're taking a look at those balance sheets and starting to work that pencil a little bit looking at next year, Brian. It's not enviable for anybody in the whole production side right now. It, I mean, it's not the machinery dealers don't have easy conversations with producers who would like to buy more equipment or newer equipment or upgrade. Uh, the lenders are having challenging and difficult conversations with a lot of farmers. Just it, it's, it's not like their, their customers are like bad people. It's just we started out at everything's relative, right? We started out with relatively low prices this year. And they just kept getting lower. So just not a lot of sales in the book. So trying to get that figured out. And let me kind of just highlight this on the on the D's 25 corn. So approaching 450, right? So if you were, uh, one of your listeners was listening to us several weeks back, my bias was, look, 450 could look pretty good versus $4 um, for D's 24. And then we went a little bit under $4, but that's time of year. You got to remember when we were looking at that, you're looking at, at December corn sliding on a downtrend and the crop pretty much, you know, looking pretty robust and in the ground. So there's a difference of price relative to time. 
And so I'm not in a real anxious hurry to get a uh, DS25 sale started. But if somebody uh, wanted to start some hedge arrives at 450, just to hope to be just dead wrong, life could be worse. Um, if we come back with a big crop next year. So we're just at a time of the year where we can talk about a lot of different things. I think patience for the new crop might have a little bit more merit um, before we get too far over our skis and get too aggressive. Brian Doherty, Senior Market Advisor at Total Farm Marketing is our guest analyst here today. Livestock trade, Brian, uh, we had a kind of a down day there led by the cattle markets, uh, some triple digit losses. Cash country has been pretty slow to get going here post Labor Day. Uh, your thoughts, uh, starting with cattle, uh, any big things that you're going to be watching there as we go throughout the rest of the week? Yeah. So remember, it's a shortened week. So already at Thursday, so we got one more day. I want to see what cash does tomorrow. But and I was kind of impressed with the cattle market the first uh, well, this is our third, the first two market days of the week that the board price is more or less held together. Now, they didn't rally and look sharp, but they didn't fall apart either. Today kind of looks a little negative, sliced back under the 10 day moving average. I'm sure that uncovered some stops as well. Bulls want to be continually buying the buy side. They, you know, just limited supply. Uh, but as we've talked, you know, the marketplace seems to have a very tepid concern. I think, uh, again, the big three inflation, interest rates and just consumer dollars that can't get stretched as far and so it's a little bit challenging all that being said though it, it looks to me like if you kind of knock off the highs and the lows and i happen to be looking at the december contract it has spent a lot of time since january give or take let's call it five to eight dollars either side of 170 so big picture is continued consolidation well supported short term somewhat under pressure uh, a little disappointing in the feeder cattle market today. That that's softened up uh, almost two and a half to three dollars. Uh, kind of a negative looking picture there. But the bulls who argue, hey, we had to have this little bit of a pullback today, has formed the right shoulder of an inverted head and shoulders formation that points to higher. I still think you got a limited supply, but the marketplace has to has to have anticipation that we're going to get these deferred months higher. We talk about historicals. Typically, we're kind of down into this time of the year. So if you want to be a buyer, if you're speculating in the cattle market, you're looking for a point to buy here and be long into the winter months. And it feels like, too, in the case of feeder cattle, it's like sometimes I get the perception that when we get a downside move type of day, we may be over exaggerated a little bit in the feeder more feeder market more so than the fat cattle market and i think that might be a little bit of a source of frustration for some folks in that market brian oh i i think it is and there's a lot of areas you can kind of point to areas of frustration but i i guess my you know we've talked about this all along we want to bias ourselves toward friendly in that beef complex but rallies are made to buy puts puts are a good tool for a good reason so look at your put protection look at your fence strategies where you buy put sell a call challenge the market to go higher uh but as we look at the big picture you know one of the things that's that's going to be uh continuously i want to say readily available is is a cheaper feed source for a while so you know that that believe that or not that that does have a concern that especially if you had to fall temperatures that you could add weight gain pretty quick to cattle got moderate temperatures, plenty of feed, they, they gain well. I think that's one of the reasons why we have a tendency to kind of see the weaker prices when we do. Big picture though, gosh, I just, I, I got to stay with my bias that the market has room to work higher, but uh, we'll be cautiously optimistic. How about that dairy trade? Uh, give us some thoughts there post a Labor Day holiday, Brian. How are things shaping up over on that side of the equation? Um, you know, strong. Uh, it still continues to look good. So we had our cheese trade uh, today with little change uh, uh today may, maybe a penny i think we have a penny and a half or penny gain in the blocks and down a half of the barrels something like that but uh, the the barrels uh, right now 225 uh 100 weight and then the the blocks at 223 so in theory you add those two together and times it by you know divide by two multiply by tens and that should give you some perspective where the cattle uh milk market should be and lo and behold You've got your contract September 2266, 2289, uh, October 2247 in November, and then December 2165. All really good prices, all prices that should be hedged. Uh, the dairy market has had a lot of volatility lately um, over the last 
mm. couple of weeks, we've had limit down, we've had limit higher. Um, those are telltale signs that a market is probably reaching or getting to a point where both bulls and bears are pretty passionate and they're pretty aggressive. Usually it tells me we're getting toward a topping window. The thing is, though, the deferred months have continued to stay somewhat lower. And the expectation is in the dairy industry that $22, $23 milk is going to bring production back online. We're going to grow the herd. So your deferred months, looking at the February and beyond, haven't reached $20. They're, they're all trading around 19 Still good prices to look at, but I think for the moment we'd be patient, see if we can't cross the 20 threshold and then start to initiate some hedges there. Again, same problems with deep beef and hogs and all these markets here. Is, you know, how far does the consumer dollar stretch? Very true. Brian, final thoughts as we wrap up our conversation today. Anything you want to mention or reiterate to folks listening in? I think just always kind of pay attention and be vigilant, especially when there's pretty good price rallies. Uh, and I, and it's hard to say, you know, that corn's out of pretty good. It's, it's up off its lows nicely. Um, but I, I'm talking big picture perspective. We just finished with dairy. Look at dairy. Look at cattle. Look at some of these markets that really offer some good long-term value and recognize that that tight supplies drive those values, yet higher prices also curb demand. So the higher you go, the likelier it is you can kind of, it's like, a, a, you know, something falling off a bridge. It can all of a sudden just fall and lose momentum. So, you know, have conversations, be critical in your thinking, look at you know, different tools. I like, you know, some of these markets, if you get a bull market, you buy puts and leave the top side open. If you've got a bear market, we have a tendency to be a little bit more aggressive. We can still buy puts, but selling futures because we're, we're going with the trend. Um, so that's kind of wordy, but that's, that's my, uh, that's all in the week. Brian, if folks want to reach out to you for a conversation at Total Farm Marketing, how can they get in touch with you, sir? I, I'd, I'd first like a phone call. Uh, we, we love calls and we love to, to listen. So 800-334-9779. Shoot me an email. That's Brian with a Y at totalfarmmarketing.com or check out our website, totalfarmmarketing.com. Brian Doherty, always a pleasure. Thanks for joining us here on Market Talk. Have a great weekend. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you, Jesse, you as well. Make sure to subscribe to the Market Talk YouTube channel. You can watch our latest interviews with top market analysts in the country, find bonus content, and much more. It's easy. Just go to youtube.com slash at Market Talk Egg and hit the subscribe button. Or you can search for Market Talk Egg on YouTube.